First Samuel chapter number three. It'd be all right if I talk, preach to you this morning. You'd be okay with that? You won't fall out with me? I mean, I'm not much of a talking kind of a preacher, but um, seeing how I got a bad headache and can't hear out of my ear, maybe we'll slow things down this morning a little bit. First Samuel chapter three and verse eight, and when you got it, if you could say amen. We're going to read verse, we're going to read verses eight through verse number 12. If you got it, say amen. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. And the Bible said, And when I begin, I will also make an end. If God says he's going to do anything, I believe he's going to do what he says he's going to do. I want to talk to you this morning on something that I uh, feel like would be of a great value to us as a people, and I want to talk to you this morning on the value of his voice, the value of God's voice. We just stretch your hand to this, this morning to the Lord and ask God to have his way. Father, this morning we are coming before you, asking you to just speak directly, divinely to us. Not just our ears, but let our heart hear you today. Let it get all the way down into who we are. And I pray, God, that it will affect our character. God, it will change us in ways. God, it will help us to be a better people. Help us to be closer in our relationship with you. We'll praise you, and everyone can say amen. I believe this morning that a lot of people that are saved... I mean, I'm pretty sure if I were to take a poll, most everybody would agree with this. But I believe that most people who are saved would like to believe that they listen to or they listen for the voice of God. If I was to take a general poll and ask the majority of God's people, hey, do you listen for the voice of God? Do you listen to God? I believe that most people would say that they do. That they're always listening, like they've got their antennas up. But in truth, that's not always the case. Because if I were to ask you this morning, when is the last time that you can genuinely say that you heard the voice of God? When's the last time that you feel that God spoke to you? Some of you here may say, man, well, it was just 24 hours ago. Somebody might say it was last month, but believe it or not, most people can hardly remember the last time that God spoke to them. Sometimes that's because we have a misconception about the way God speaks. We fail to realize that God doesn't just speak in an audible voice. Some people seem to think that if God's going to speak to me, it's going to sound just like it is as I'm talking to you. That's not always the case. God can speak to you through the word when it's preached, when it's read. He can speak to you through his spirit. He can show you something which thus speaks to you, a situation, and it comes to your realization what God's trying to show you. God can speak to you through a dream. 
But most people understand when I say that God speaks to you, you know there are people that can say, hey, I'd love to say that he has, but the honest, honest truth is I don't remember the last time God spoke to me. The reason that is important is because we receive direction from God. If you're deciding, hey, I need to, you know, I feel like I need to buy another vehicle, it'd be very imperative and it would be beneficial to you to hear the voice of God before that you just step out and do something without hearing from God. There are some people this morning that could testify and say, I've stepped out in some things that I thought were God, but God didn't speak to me, and that was my mess, not God's. And I created a situation God didn't. Am I on track? Say amen. But it's important for us to listen, to be able to hear. Some folks may say it's been, been a little while. Some say, I've, I've even had people tell me, Pastor Myers, I don't know that I've ever can ever remember that God's ever spoke to me. And I believe that that can have a lot to do with the misunderstanding of the ways that God can speak to people. But if it is true that you don't think, you don't feel that God's ever spoke to you, it's a sad thing. Because I do believe that God will speak. As I was getting ready for church this morning, I began to think to myself about the way through the years that God has spoke to me. And for whatever reason, maybe the Lord just led me this direction. Have you ever had those times of your life that in your conscience or your subconscious, you're in a situation of temptation and the, thro the thought runs through your mind, well, you should just do this. Well, you ought to just take that money. Nobody will ever know. Y'all just, just cuss them out. Slap them right upside the head. That's what you should do. How many honest people will raise your hand and say you ever had thoughts like that come through your mind? There are times that it's nothing more than our random thoughts. But I wanted to show you the same way that those negative, evil, unrighteous thoughts speak into your mind and your spirit. In like manner, the Spirit of God speaks into our heart. There have been times before that maybe you didn't identify that it was the voice of God, but God spoke to you and said, no, you need to tell him you're sorry. No, you need to apologize. Now, you know that wasn't right. Now, you need to turn around. You need to make that right. You know you hurt them. There's times the Spirit of God spoke to you and told you, now how would you feel if they did that to you? There are some people that are so evil, I've wondered if they ever have ever had thoughts like that. But I just believe that everybody, if they have their ears open even just a little bit, that the voice of God's reasoning has spoke to them. This is how God brings conviction in our life. I remember it's been a while Maybe when Brother Coon first came here, he was telling me about a situation that got a little out of control. And after the fact, he said, you know, I got to feeling bad about that thing, you know. And I had to go back and tell a man, hey, look, I'm sorry. But you know what that was that was working on you? That was the voice of God speaking into your conscience, reason, telling you what you did was not acceptable. In the moment, you may have been upset. In the moment, you may have felt justified, but it wasn't right. That's the way God speaks to us oftentimes. And if you've ever had God deal with you like that, can you raise your hand and say amen? And I do believe that for many people, it's not that God is not speaking. He just, maybe for them, he's not saying what they want to hear. Now, I might get quiet, but... For a lot of people, if God's not saying what they want to hear, then they just tune him out. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and you can tell that what you're saying, they don't want to hear it because they tuned you out? Nothing drives me more crazy than when I'm in the middle of trying to explain something in great detail and somebody just completely zones out. And I, sometimes I just stop in the middle like, I, 
I might as well just shut up because they're not hearing nothing I'm saying. I'm just wasting breath. But I have found with some people will actually tune you out unless you're saying what they want to hear. And if you're telling them something that may go against the grain, they don't want to hear it, but then they tune you out. And some people don't listen to hear, they listen to reply. So when they do hear anything, they're already making their defense in their mind. So they're not really receiving or absorbing what it is that you're saying. And I believe it's the same when it comes to the Spirit of God speaking to people. Because if the Lord deals with you to get rid of something, to change something, to stop doing something. Well, if it goes against the grain of the flesh, there may be a tendency within us that says, you know what? Maybe that's not God, you know, maybe, maybe because what you're doing is you're trying to justify within your own flesh that that can't possibly be God. But how many of you know that God has his own agenda and it's not ours? How many of you know that this morning? God knows what is best for us. So even in situations where we think that we may know what it is that God's trying to say, it's imperative for us to take the time to listen. I remember when I had long, hadn't long been saved, I remember the preacher making a point one time, and I thought to myself, you know, he's, he's right. But there's been many times of my Christian walk that I was busy in speaking, but not busy in listening. What do you mean? Have you ever been down in a place of prayer, and you're just piling all this stuff on God? God, I need you to fix this. And God, I'm sorry, would you forgive me for that? And I mean you're busy speaking, but you're not busy listening. And I remember that early on as a Christian, I remember the pastor that I sat under trying to give us good wisdom and encouragement and telling us there are times that you need to get in a place of prayer and just be quiet and let God speak to you. There were times that I got down in a place of prayer all by myself. You know, the Bible talks about going into that closet and shutting the door. It doesn't literally mean that you got to find a linen closet in the house. But if that's what makes you feel better, then by all means, get in the linen closet. But I got into a place of privacy with me and God. And I said, Lord, I want to hear what you have to say. And I didn't say nothing else. I just lay there or kneel there and wait to hear the voice of God. Because sometimes we think that it's in our much speaking. Well, if I say it eloquently, do you know that God even understands ghetto slang? I mean, if you were raised in the hood, God understands what you're trying to say whenever you start talking to God. You don't have to sound like that you graduated from, uh, you know, Duke University or, or, or Harvard or somewhere. How many of you know that our God is capable of speaking to us whenever we're, we're just saying simple, plain English words or, or whatever we're saying to God? God knows how to respond to us. And if you agree, say amen. But I believe this morning that if we pray that God will give us direction. But I also believe that truthfully some have already decided what they want God to say. I've seen situations where someone will say, well, you know, Lord, I, I, I really want to move over here. And I, I just feel like it would be better for our family. And in their mind, they've already made up in their mind what they believe God will say. What they want God to say. So they don't give it the ample time to get the answer, and they move. Do you know how many people I've watched as a pastor get themselves in a mess simply because they thought that it was right, and they did not wait on God to speak to them? Amen. I can tell you as a young man, I learned that real quick. If I was to testify, it's a little embarrassing, but honesty is the best medicine, you know, they say. But I was a young man, and I, wanted, I was eager, I was motivated, I, I believed I could, you know, I wanted to serve God, I wanted to see people saved, and uh, I, I wasn't waiting on God like I should on ministry. And so I, so I started turning doorknobs that God never intended me, for me to turn, trying to open doors that God didn't open, because I was so eager, I was ambitious, I wanted to see things happen. You know what I found out to be true? That I ended up dragging my family through situations and getting out of the will of God because I wasn't waiting on the voice of God. I'll give you a good example of that. This is an actual fact. This is not just a presumption. 
but I was attending a church of God, and I got it in my mind, well, this church isn't good enough. And after some period of time, we ended up leaving. We started our own ministry. That didn't last very long. We ended up going to a particular church. It was just a small little church. And I thought, well, maybe these people, you know, these people have got it going on. So we sat underneath that ministry for a long time. And I could tell you of each stop along the way, there was probably six, seven different things we went through. And guess what? Eventually, we got to a place where that we kind of hit rock bottom. And you won't believe this, but guess where we ended right back up at? In the church of God. And I remember when we thought about it. Now, listen, this is not a publicity ad for the church of God. This is making a point of where God wanted us for a reason. God had a goal. And I remember telling my wife that I felt like that God was wanting us to go to this particular church. And my wife looked at me and said, What? Are you sure? I don't want to go back in the church of God. That's what she told me. We were independent. I don't want to go back in the church of God. But you see, it wasn't about what she wanted, about what I wanted. So what I'm showing you is that we, went, we came full circle. And all this time, I feel like was a lot of wasted time for God to bring us right back where we started at. And to say, now, now start over. And I wouldn't have been here for going on 16 years had we not been mindful of this, some of you have heard me tell this story before. After going through years of feeling like failed this and failed that, I've never been the type of person to short-live anything. I'm a long-term person, long-term relationship. I like to stick with stuff. I don't like here and there and over there. But my life had became that. And I finally got to a place where I, I began to pray and I said, God, I need to hear from you. I need you to speak to me. And I'm not doing anything until I hear from you. I need to know exactly where you want me to be. And that is how that we ended up where we're at today. Because for three months, it was three of the hardest months of my life, I wanted to make a decision. We were kind of floating. I had a pastor friend of mine. We were temporarily we were evangelizing but we were going to his church visiting around different places trying to find the mind of God and I remember going to his church and I remember him getting upset when I told him I said now if you see us here this is not necessarily going to be our permanent residence we need a place to feed we need a place to eat spiritually until I hear the voice of God and he didn't understand it but that was fine with me three difficult months not knowing exactly where our home church would be. If you knew anything about me and my wife, we were workers. We would get in a church. We would work hard, support the church. We were there every service, sometimes five and six times a week. And this was so strange for us. Such a difficult place. But you've heard me testify of the night that I got down in an altar in a church and began to pray and the Lord spoke to me after three long, hard months and said, this is where I want you. People will not understand, but this is where I want you. God doesn't have to say a whole lot to say a whole lot. That night when I called my wife on the phone, some of you have heard this story numerous times, I don't know. When I called my wife, I told her, she said, babe, that don't make no sense. That's what she said to me. And I laughed. She wanted to know what I was laughing about. I said, because that's what God said to me. He said, this is where I want you. People won't understand it. I said, you just confirmed it. Okay, babe, if you say so. And here we are, you know, in a loose way of saying it. Here we are killing it. You know what I'm saying? But why is that? Because at some point in my life, I had to slow down long enough to say, God, I don't want a bunch of hope so, a bunch of maybe so. It might work. It might not work. Well, this sounds like a good idea. I need to know your perfect will. I don't want to take a step without knowing it. I don't want to think I know the will of God. I need to know that I know that I know. How many of you know that when you know that you know, you get a peace? 
If you know any of our family, I've got some of the funniest family you've ever met before. I've got an Aunt Lisa. She is just an absolute nut. And she, she said something to me one time, and I just about lost it. She said, honey, I just want you to know. I, done, I know down in my knower. So, folks, let me tell you something. Sometimes you got to know down in your knower. And when you know down in your knower, you get a peace about it. Come on, you're not train wrecked about it because you're okay with it. Because God has given you that peace. How many of you know that if God speaks to you, you can go, you can take that to the bank. But if you're going through life and you have no assurance, then that makes you feel uneasy. It makes you feel on edge, on nerve. But how many of you know that when you can get an answer from God, it will give you the peace that passes all understanding? I, I remember several years, I don't know why that this comes to my mind. But you may have heard me tell a story when my daughter was really young. and She would gotten very, very sick, burning up with a fever. Everybody else had a fever and had the same kind of symptoms. And, and a lot of people were going to the hospital at this particular time. And I remember my daughter, she was very, very ill. And I had not long got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Man, I, I felt like I could whoop a, an army by myself. I mean, when you get filled with the Holy Ghost and you get the real Holy Ghost, I mean, you just feel like, boy, you could whoop up on the devil, you know what I mean? And so I was full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost, excited. Well, my daughter got sick. And at that particular time, I remember that we had keys to the church. And uh, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to go up to the church and I'm going to pray at the church. I, I went up there and I prayed. And while I was praying, several things happened. But one of the things that happened that made me think of this story, as I was pacing back and front, forth in front of the church, praying, asking God to heal my daughter, the Lord spoke to me and said, it's done. And immediately I got a peace. I felt it whenever the Lord spoke to me, it's done. I stopped what I was doing. I went home. I walked in the door. And I said, how is she? She said, she's burning up with a fever. I said, hand her to me. And I'm not kidding you when I tell you, I sat down in the chair, my wife handed me the baby and her fever went just like that. And she went from laying around limp like you like just, you know, uh, uh, some wilted flowers to running around the house, not another single problem. How many of you know that it matters whenever God speaks? We need to hear the voice of God. We need to know the voice of God. And I want to tell you this morning, one of the greatest famines in our land today is not a famine of food. Famine, whenever there's no food in the land, that's bad. Because that means there's a lot of death. But do you know the greatest famine of all is a famine of the voice of God speaking to his people. That's exactly what was happening in the days whenever God spoke to Samuel in our text. Similar to the way that it was in the book of Amos chapter number 8 and verse 11. I want to read something to you so it makes sense. It said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Now, you can have a lot of people speaking, saying, God said, God said, but it not be God said. You know what I mean? Verse number 12 said, And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. First of all, I had to ask myself, why were they not able to hear the voice of God? But I believe if you study their story, that a lot of it had to do with the fact that for so long, they pushed the voice of God away. That God purposely for a season remained silent. Well, in other words, you've already made up in your mind what you want to hear you're going to do what you want to do no matter what I say. So there's no reason for me to even say anything. Now, I don't want to start an argument between husbands and wives, but wives, help me out. Have you ever had a situation where your husband said, babe, I need to buy this certain thing. You know, I need some new rims on my truck, babe. I need a new radio, babe. I need this new gun. You know, it's the newest edition Glock so-and-so. And you're like, babe, you don't need that. And he's like, no, I'm going to tell you the reason why this special edition, it shoots bullets straighter than the other ones. You know what I mean? It's shiny. It's black. It's got a better grip. And after a while, you're like, What, what, what do you think? Buy it. You're going to buy whatever I say anyway. Buy it. No matter what I say, 
You done made up in your mind. You, you already got it in your back pocket. I know. I know you. It don't matter what I think. You just want to hear me say yes, you feel better about it. Come on, help me out, ladies. It's the same way when it comes to the things of God oftentimes. Because what it is, is that you've made up in your mind that you want a certain thing. That's the reason why that we get people in ministry that are married that can fall out of marriage with somebody on the platform and jump right into marriage with somebody else sitting on the pew two weeks later like nothing, nothing, nothing doing. Somebody say, that's foolish. That ain't the way that it works. God don't bust up marriages that he put together, amen, to turn right around and put you in. He didn't give you somebody else's husband or somebody else's wife. Come on now. That ain't the way God works. Some folk may not like that. They say, well, Pastor Myers, are you sure? I'm just here to tell you that God is a holy and a righteous God. And if you're really hearing from God, amen, God's not going to lead you into the paths of unjust, unrighteous, ungodly filth. What God does is holy. What God does is right. And if it ain't right, then God didn't tell you to do it. I've had people tell me, well, the Lord told me this and God told me that. Listen, I've seen people that are living in straight up absolute gross sin. T trying to tell people what God said. I'm telling you, you better back up and punt. Somebody say amen. I want you to see that this spiritual famine that they're dealing with in chapter number 3 of the book of Samuel has led the people of Israel to a place where there's been no yea, thus saith the Lord, in a long time. God raises up a young man, an innocent young man. You know, I got to thinking about this. And if you take the whole context of the story, it makes a lot more sense. Eli is the high priest. His two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were two boys that had created, that had committed adultery or fornication, if you will, on what is considered the very doorstep of the temple of the house of God. They had committed gross sins under the watch of Eli, the high priest. And Eli did not correct them and put them out like he should have. Well, you know what God was beginning to see? God was beginning to see that this older generation, they're going to do what they want to do, whether I tell them what to do or not. So God, the Bible shows us that God stopped speaking. Oh, there were people running around, false prophets, and saying, yea, the Lord has said, the Lord has said. But God hadn't said anything in a long time. Can you imagine, here is a night where that it's been a long time since the Lord's really spoke to anybody. And yet you've got Eli, the high priest, whose vision has waxed dim. That was a symbol of a spiritual problem. He was an old man. His eyes had physically got to the place that he couldn't see very well. And the Bible tells us, ere the lamp, the temple, the light, the fire in the temple had gone out. And there was always one fire that was to never go out. At nighttime, they would put so many lamps out, but leave at least one burning. Well, that night, the Bible shows us how that in one place, all the fire had gone out. That's not the way God intended it. That's not what God told them to do. But under the watch of a man whose physical eyes had become weak and dim, spiritually, his vision became weak and dim. Let that be a message to those of you that say, well, I've been in this all of my life. Well, guess what? You can be in this all of your life and be backslid, lukewarm and cold on God and unprepared for the bride to return at midnight and say, behold, the bridegroom's coming. Say amen. You've got to be careful that you don't think that just because you got stars and stripes on your shoulder or you've been an elder for 25 and a half years or you pastored a church for so long, none of that means anything if you lose your connection with God and your spirit spiritual eyes begin to get dim and wax old and amen and the fire goes out that was what God was showing a spiritual example that inside of Eli that a fire had gone out God said I've got to raise up a brand new young man
Listen, God may have to do the same thing in the year 2024 if some of our elders don't step up to the place and rekindle the fire of God and and open up their spiritual eyes to hear from heaven once again. God raised up Samuel because he needed somebody that would listen. That's a, that's, a, that's a surprise to think that of all the ears across the globe, there was one young man laying in the bed one night by the name of Samuel. A young man that God had blessed his mama, opened up her womb, and he's been dedicated to the service of God from a young age. Here he is in the temple. He doesn't really have the close connection and personal relationship with God like some of maybe the elders once did. He doesn't understand what it's like hearing from God. So one night, Brother Matt, he's laying in the bed. Some of you know the story. God calls him Samuel. He sits up in the bed. I can see him looking around the room. He gets out of bed and he goes in there to where Eli is at. You called me? No, son, I didn't, I didn't call you. Well, there was a respect of authority for him to do that. Now go lay down. So he goes and he lays down. While he's laying there, Sister Rachel, God says, Samuel, Samuel. So he sits up in the bed, he goes back out. Eli, you you called me? No, son, I didn't call you. Go lay down. If you hear it again, maybe it's God talking to you. Answer him. So the boy goes back and lays down. And it's there that his, his little ears are perked up, those little innocent ears. God speaks to that man, and he tells him, Something that he apparently wasn't able to tell Eli, because maybe Eli wouldn't listen. You heard it when I read it, possibly in the text. He said, I'm going to start something, and I'm going to finish what I started. You know what he was going to do? He was going to bring that leadership under Eli down. He used the very young man that went back and forth underneath that priest watch. To be the very one to rebuke that man. So what did God tell you last night? Do you really want to know Eli? Because some people have it in their mind. What God is going to say. How many of you that have been in this for a little while? Don't don't think that just because you've been around it or you've been it all the time that you've become some kind of a perfect spiritual weather forecaster and you always know what God's doing, what God's thinking, and what God's about to do because based on what he's done in the past. How many of you know this time God might spit in a man's eyes? Next time he might rub dirt and spit in his eyes. Next time he may just speak a word. Next time he may just touch you on the top of the head. Next time he might not do anything but just look you in the face and you get healed. Our God does what he wants to, when he wants to, how he wants to. And it is up to us to have our ears open to say, God, speak to me. Say amen, someone. In the days of Eli, there's this big reliance upon the many voices of the day. People are listening to whoever they can because they're trying to get a word from God when there is none. And so they'll listen to whoever. Do you know that even in our day today, people are grappling. They're grappling at anything. And somebody said, well, the Lord said. I am so reluctant to jump on that, the Lord said, bandwagon. There are people that live like the devil. I'll tell you, well, God said this and God said that. Well, there are people that had uh, uh, folks drinking Kool-Aid in a field and killed themselves over somebody saying, God said. So if somebody tells you God said, first of all, you better check and make sure God really said. And second of all, stop believing this foolishness that the same God that spoke to them can't speak to you. Do you know that whenever Jesus Christ died, was crucified? The Bible said that the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. What that means, and you go back and study, you will understand. 
there was a place of intercession opened up. And Christ has become a mediator for you and me. I don't have to go to Mary. I don't have to go to St. Peter. A matter of fact, to me, that's just complete foolishness. They were nothing more than a man just like you and me. Mary was the conduit by which Christ came into the world. But I don't, I don't have to pray to Mary to get my answer. She's not my mediator. The veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. That gave you the same access as your pastor. That means that you don't have to go through Moses. You don't got to go through Elijah. You ain't got to go through any other prophet or minor prophet, major prophet. You can go straight to the throne room yourself. That's why God told you to because it was made possible by Jesus Christ. He is the mediator. He is the one that takes that message straight to the throne. He's the one that I can communicate with. Aren't you glad that you don't got to go and sit in a booth, uh, put on some beads and tell everybody your life story that you can get down on your knees in private and talk to God by yourself? Come on, somebody, and say amen. At day's end, I don't need another man to touch the hem of his garment. I can get down and touch it myself. Thank God for men and women of God. Thank God for people who intercede on our behalf. But never cease to know that if you need an answer, you don't got to go to somebody else. You can go straight to the source yourself. Come on, somebody, and give God praise. Before long in their day, everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. This is what was happening even in the days of Jeremiah. The Bible said in Judges chapter 17 and 6, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his eyes. Do you know that in Judges, the reason why that people were doing what they thought was right in their eyes, because there was no king in the land. Do you know that when there's no king in the land, when there's no king sitting on the throne of our heart, that people do what they think is right. But when the king sits on the throne, the king speaks and the king says, no, don't touch that. Yes, do that. Tell them you're sorry. The king says, pay that back. The king says, no, don't go there. Don't think like that. Don't act like that. But when there's no king on the throne, men do what they think is right in their own eyes. How many this morning says, king of, God, of all glory, sit on the throne of my heart and tell me what you want me to do. I don't just want to do what I think is right in my own eyes. I really, truly believe that if you really love God, it is a painful idea to think that you may not hear from Him. The idea that you need an answer, but you might not hear from Him. That would be a painful thought to people that really love God. But listen to what the psalmist said. Psalm chapter 28, verse 1. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. You hear what he says? Be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. In other words, I'm going to shrivel up and die. I need to hear from you. Oh, that we would get back to a generation and a day within the church where we survive by hearing the voice of God. That we soak it up like a plant soaks up water. Amen. You can't bloom without the water. And without the water, we'll die. You've got to hear from God. And the best way to do that is you've got to first want to hear what he has to say. God, I want to know what you have to say. I want to know what you're saying to me. The Bible has shown us throughout the many benefits and even the tragedies of those that will and those will, that will not listen to the voice of God. And it's up to us. We can either prosper with his direction or we can drift like a ship out on the ocean without his direction. I've watched people get themselves in some straight up messes because they didn't hear from God. The voice of the Lord can bring fear to those who are hiding from God. Sometimes when people are running from God or hiding from God, they don't really want to hear from God. Because they know it probably won't be anything good. Genesis 3 and 8. God showed us that with Adam. And they heard the voice of the Lord God. 
Anyone hear that? That heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. When you know you're not doing what you're supposed to, the voice of God brings fear. Nations are destroyed that will not hear the voice of the Lord. What I worry about America is America has been a strong nation, great technology. But the more that we see the moral compass of America going down the tank, the more concerned I get for America. Because a nation that won't listen to God is a nation in trouble. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 20 said, As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. But on the other hand, the blessings of God will follow those who will listen. Listen to what it said in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse number 1, because I want you to see both sides of this. And it shall come to pass that thou shalt hearken, diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. You got people talking about you. You got people trying to bring you down. You got threats of the enemy whispering in your ear. You got people that are opposed to you. Well, I want you to know something. There's protection in the voice of God. God can tell you what to do, how to do, and when to do it and bring protection to you. He said in Deuteronomy chapter 30, And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. But what I have found about people is that sometimes people want God to speak to them without drawing them closer to the fire of God. And I want God's direction, but I don't want you to draw me too close to that fire. Because if you do, you're going to require more of my life. Listen, Acts chapter 7 and verse 30. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to them him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. And when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight as he drew near to behold it. The voice of the Lord came unto him. Do you remember when Moses was in that place on the backside of the desert? And God lit a fire and a tumbleweed. God has a way through the fire of God to draw you in. And some, they know that if I listen... God may give me directions and it may mean that I can't pursue some of the things in my life that I thought I was supposed to pursue. Well, let me explain this to you. God has that blueprint of your life and knows exactly what's best for you. You can chase after all your own ideals about what life should be. But how many of you know that God knows what's best? How many of you this morning said, Lord, I want you to speak to me? How many of you that are here this morning said, Lord, I need you to speak to my kids. I need you to speak to my grandkids. If we expect God to speak to us, I believe he needs to know a few things. I'm going to share these, and I'm going to try to close. I want you to pause for a minute. I want you to look this way. I want you to hear me because this is very important. If we expect God to speak to us, he needs to know. Number one, we will listen. He needs to know that we even care about what he has to say. The same way I made mention earlier, whenever people don't really care about what you have to say, when you're talking to them, you pick up on that. And you know what you generally quit doing? You quit talking. Not only that, but God needs to know that we will take heed. It's one thing to hear it. But it's a whole different thing to apply it, that you'll do something about it. That if you're in the altar and God says, you know what, that cousin that you cut out of your life that you've been beefing with for the last three years, you need to go home, you need to call him on the phone and tell him you're sorry. 
So if you get up from that place of prayer and you say, yeah, but God, yeah, but God, but yeah, but God, and you never do it, it's of no value to you. For God to speak to you if you ain't going to take heed to it. If God's going to speak to you, he needs to be able to know that we will act on and apply what he tells us even if it costs you something. It might cost you a reputation. There are people sitting in prison right now that probably could have got away with whatever it was they did if they would have just kept their mouth shut, not said anything. But sometimes our God-given conscience, God will speak and God says, be honest. Will you take and apply what God tells you to do, even if it costs you something? Even if it costs you something. I remember... And I brought this up this morning, this young couple here, they're talking about getting married. And I told them, I said, you know, I'll give you some advice. I tell anybody the same thing before you get married. If there's anything that's, that's covered, get it out on the table before you get married. It makes it awful bitter after you get married. And somebody say, man, I wish you'd have told me that before. Why didn't you tell me that? Just be honest. I remember whenever my wife and I, we were we had dated for like four years before we got married. And I, I could stand here and tell you that, you know, the four years were like four of the greatest years of our life. But actually, it was pretty rough. We were neither one of us completely faithful to each other. There were things we had to forgive. And before we got married, we had to put a lot of things on the table. Some of those things were pretty hurtful. But I felt like the best thing for us is to be honest. And we were. We made an agreement with each other that we could ask whatever question that we wanted to ask. There were some things I would ask my wife. She said, well, I really would rather not talk to her. But we agreed. We got it all out on the table. So that we can move on. One of the reasons why that sometimes people can't do anything as far as to be honest if it will cost, even if it means it'll cost them something. Stand to your feet. But if God speaks to you and God tells you you need to do something, will you be? My wife can vouch for this. I'm not just making this up. Right here, pastor in this church, after being here for a couple of years, I was preaching about being honest. We were driving down the road sometime after that, and I got a phone call from a boyfriend of a lady's daughter that went to church here who was in service when I preached that. This guy went on to tell me something that I never thought I'd ever hear anything crazy like that in all my life. He went on to tell me how that he raped and murdered a girl when he was living in Hawaii while he was stationed there in the military, buried her body there. At first you're thinking, is this, doc, is this guy on something that, because, I mean, you don't expect to hear stuff like that. And he said that that wasn't the only person, that he had killed another girl here in the States, buried her, and they still don't know where she's at. I said, do you still know where the bodies are at? He said, yeah. I said, well, you need to come clean. Yeah, but I don't want to go to prison. I, you know, go to prison the rest of my life. You know, won't God just... Forgive me and just, you know, like it's all done. I said, well, those families of those girls deserve the closure. And you need to make it right. 
Well, I didn't hear anything from him for a while. And what was it, about two or three months later? The daughter that he was with came up dead. Remember that? We did our funeral service here. Supposedly, the daughter died from taking too much cold medicine. But after knowing what I knew, it was kind of hard to believe. Because when I talked to her mom, she said that was not like her. She was in the medical field. She knew how much medicine to take. When you don't listen to God, it don't just cause damage in your life. It causes damage in other people's lives. I wonder how many people this morning says, Lord, I want to hear from you. It's been a while. I need to tune in. I got some big decisions in my life. I need to know. I need a peace. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning, Sister Miranda, if you'd like to play something, that's fine. I want to give everyone in this church an opportunity to find a place in the altar of prayer. To be able to get down and say, God, I got big things coming up in my life. I need to know. I need answers. I need to hear from you. Truthfully, Lord, I don't seek you enough like I should. And I do a lot of things without thinking about how you feel about it. 